And welcome back to page two of Face the Nation. And now that Face the Nation has expanded to an hour, we have the time to do what I've always wanted to do, and that is to bring our viewers up to date from time to time on books we think that you will find of interest. Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy, both Time Magazine editors, have collaborated on a new book called The President's Club with a new take on the relationship of past and current presidents. It is chock full of surprises. On my far right, Robert Mary, editor of the National Interest Magazine, author of the upcoming book, Where They Stand, The American Presidents in the Eyes of Voters and Historians. It examines how we rate our presidents and rounding out the panel, CBS News contributor and presidential historian Douglas Brinkley, who has a new book out and it is about Walter Cronkite. It is called Cronkite. And he's the man, of course, who covered all the presidents from Truman to Kennedy and Johnson to Nixon and finally uh, Ronald Reagan. And uh, I will start with you, Doug, because my biases are clearly showing. Uh, <laughs> Walter Cronkite was my uh, mentor. He was my role model. He was who I wanted to be when I was a young reporter. He's who I still want to be. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about your book. Uh, it's, it's got some stuff in it. I thought I knew a lot about Walter Cronkite. I found some things I didn't know. But since we're talking about presidents and so forth this morning, uh, Walter had access and really enjoyed a very good relationship with all the presidents of his time. I wonder, did you, as you were writing this book, uh, how do you think has the relationship between presidents and and the press changed uh, since Walter's time? Was he the last one to enjoy those kind of relationships? I, I think he may have been the last one. You know, his first president he got to interview in 1951 was Harry Truman, and Cronkite was from Missouri, and so, um, you know, Truman was the, the boy from Independence, and he got to do a guided tour. Truman gave Cronkite of the White House, but Walter was so nervous he could barely talk. He was a cub reporter basically and he would ask uh, Truman things like do the clocks work <laughs> and you know in the White House and he was very sad about his performance but by the time it clicked into gear with the Eisenhower years he got very close to Eisenhower because Bill Paley the head of CBS used to work for Eisenhower in World War II and Walter ended up having great success with Ike he even went later to Normandy with him famously but it was John F. Kennedy that really triggered Kennedy as David Halbert stamps it was our first television president and uh, Walter got in the mix. He got a huge interview on CBS just months before Kennedy died. And then he did, as you mentioned, all the presidents through um, up to Ronald Reagan, who gave him a, a great goodbye interview when he stepped down as anchor. But you know, uh, knowing Walter, it does not surprise me that he asked Harry Truman how the clocks worked. Walter was the most curious person I have ever met. He wanted to know how everything worked. If there was a car wreck outside this bureau right now, uh, Walter would want to run out and see what happened. It would be like it's the first car wreck he ever saw. So that does not surprise me. But, you know, Walter could get presidents on the telephone. Uh, it's not that way anymore. Uh, Michael, you and, uh, and Nancy, uh, you deal with this every day. We'll talk about your book in a it's minute. It's been a but long time since I got, ever got a president or ever imagined to get a president on the phone. It's much more staged now than it was in those days, much more controlled, their relationships between the White House, any president, any party. Uh, and the reporters, even the anchormen who cover them. Yeah, and, and, and Robert, do you, do you find that uh, surprising, the, the kind of uh, relationships that uh, the press once enjoyed with our presidents? It's, it does, it's not that way anymore. It, for one thing, there are so many more reporters. There, there are no deadlines anymore. Uh, it, it's the, the, it seems to me that the, the, the wall between the press and elected officials is much higher than it ever Absolutely. was. Absolutely. In, in one sense, the process has been more democratized because there's more reporters, there are more people with reporting power, there's more outlets, uh, there's more access to uh, the audience. But in another way, it's less democratic in the sense that these people don't have the access to the newsmakers that they used to have. I wrote a book some years ago on Joe and Stuart also, who were giants of their time in the print realm, um, and they had immense access. And a lot of people said at the time when the book came out, well, right, but uh, the, the American people weren't really invited into those uh, salons and into those uh, interviews, uh, but they gave good fare for the money. Now, everybody is a newsman, and uh, they don't have the access, but they have opinions, and so they're throwing out a lot of that stuff. Nancy, uh, uh, your book that you and Michael have written, and I understand it was five years in the making, it has an entirely new take on the presidency uh, because it makes you realize 
that uh, especially in modern times, people who were president have become very close to the people who happened to be president, and this has happened uh, several times. Uh, one of the things that I remember is when, uh, when Lyndon Johnson became president, uh, one of the first things he did was call the president who had come before he and Kennedy, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and said, I really need your help. Eisenhower came down, but there were, when was the first time that uh, the former presidents and, and whoever happened to be in office uh, decided to work together on well, things? That actually goes back to you know John Adams calling up George Washington to mm -hmm. ask him for help, but, but it's different in the modern age because you can pick up the phone, and the things that former presidents can do for a sitting president are much greater, the, both privately and publicly. But what we found that surprised us most is how often the more different presidents are, different generations, different parties, different personalities, the more likely they seem to be to be able to work together. And we see this going back to Harry Truman reaching out to Herbert Hoover, who was a pariah still, and, and secretly mailing him a letter asking him to come into the White House Tell and help him out. Tell us about that, because this was something I didn't know about. It was, it was remarkable. There's Truman, who suddenly finds himself in office in the spring of 1945, and he's facing this catastrophe in Europe as the war is ending. And he secretly writes to Hoover saying, can you come help me figure out how we're going to, to get food to the countries that need it? These two, they're very suspicious of each other. Again, they have nothing at all in common, and yet they end up forming this partnership that you could say probably saved more lives than any two men in the 20th century and worked very closely together throughout Truman's presidency. So that's really, that's how the modern President's Club at least really started. And Robert, now your book uh, is a different kind of book because you write about how do we rate presidents? How do we decide who was the successful president and who wasn't? I think uh, most uh, list makers would always say, uh, uh, Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt in some order were probably uh, the three presidents that are most admired in history in some order. Jefferson probably gets in there uh, shortly after that. Jackson and T.R. Yeah. But how is it that we decide these were the presidents that uh, mattered? Well, we have a body of literature which comes out of the polls that uh, historians do who are the great presidents, you're a historian, you know this, uh, rate the presidents. And so we have a body of literature. This has been going on since 1948 when Arthur Schlesinger Sr. began this little exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, generated a lot of interest over the years. What my book tries to posit is that that's great, that's fine, uh, it's a good index, but what were the voters thinking at the time? Because the voters were either re-electing the guy or they were rejecting the guy, they might uh, uh, re-elect him, but then uh, his party falls down at the next election. Uh, so I try to look at what the voters were saying at the time and compare those two indices to determine whether they overlap or whether there's some uh, disparities. So, so what would you consider a successful president? Uh, what, what, uh, what constitutes greatness? From the, uh, I have three tests in my book. Uh, number one, uh, from the voters' perspective, a two-term president succeeded by his own party, uh, indicating that he had two successful terms in the voters' judgment. Uh, uh, in and that's fairly rare, isn't it's it? It's very difficult. In the 20th century, there are only two presidents that really pulled it off, uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt and Reagan. If you add partial terms, TR would have been in that category as well. So only three in the 20th century fit that test. From a standpoint of the historians, um, are they consistently in the upper reaches of the historian lists? And then I have a third test, which I insert. The great presidents, the one I call leaders of destiny, are the ones who changed the political landscape and redirected the country. And who would you list as those who did? Uh, the, in that category, I have Washington, who set it all in motion, Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, TR, FDR, and then I have a little asterisk because I say that Reagan uh, ha met the voters test, he met my test of redirecting the country, but he hasn't yet risen up to those upper levels consistently in the historian polls. You know, Doug Brinkley, in your uh, book about Cronkite, uh, and I have no problem with uh, talking about Walter Cronkite <laughs> in t while we're talking about presidents, Walter Cronkite had considerable influence, did he not, on events? He had influence uh, on presidents. And I thought it was always interesting that, you know, while Ed Murrow, we, we thought of him as, as a great journalist because he expressed opinions, Walter's great power was that he so seldom 
expressed opinions. Absolutely. He was steady Eddie, and presidents could count on doing an interview with him and getting a fair shake. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, you're talking about changing culture, not getting your telephone answered. LBJ would call Cronkite directly after a broadcast to complain about something. But it was really that World War II generation of reporters. We're all in this together. We fought together, and we're trying to make America good. Vietnam War corroded that. When you started seeing Vietnam, and, and finally, you know, famously, February 27th, 1968 uh, when the Tet Offensive occurred and he came back, Walter Cronkite, and called Vietnam a stalemate. Many people connected Johnson's collapse with this objective Mr. Center now turning on the war. And then, of course, Watergate and Nixon's hatred of the press and the unleashing of Spiro Agnew. And it became a war against the Fourth Estate. And who won? The media, Woodward, Bernstein, and Walter Cronkite. And so presidents have gotten skeptical of the press. They don't, they, it's now a very antagonistic relationship, um, much more so than it was when they wouldn't show Franklin Roosevelt in a wheelchair mm. in a photo, or they wouldn't, they, everybody knew about Jack Kennedy's affairs, but wouldn't do them. Today, in a YouTube internet world, every missed smile a president does is going to be all and, over. And that story, when, when Walter Cronkite came back from Vietnam and George Christian, his, uh, 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 President uh, Johnson's press secretary told Lyndon Johnson about what Walter had said. Lyndon Johnson said, if I've lost Walter, I've lost the American people. He understood uh, at that point. Uh, and we didn't have diversified media, and TV was the new boom. And some cities only got CBS. I mean, and, and so Cronkite was the guy that you turned to every night. He was in your living room. They called Vietnam the living room war. And the, the politicians didn't adjust quickly to what television actually meant. And so, you know, whether it was fighting for civil rights or, or Vietnam or space, which became our national pageant, uh, uh, Cronkite seemed to be the maestro of it all.